at the start, it was always I wanted to prove to my dad that I didn't have to work for him. I wanted to be successful in my own right and I wanted to show my family what I could do. I wanted to provide for my whole family and I wanted to just be the best version of myself. My back was constantly against the wall. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the backing. I didn't have any advice from anyone on what to do. I was shooting in the dark. There was no blueprint. There was no mentor. There was no one to tell me what to do. So I guess I just learned over the years and it's been a long time. Like this never just all of a sudden blew up. Like it's been 12 years now. I just sent a message to his manager on Twitter. And I was like, oh, can I, can I pull up to the tour bus and give you these clothes? He's like, yeah, yeah, pull up. Chuck some clothes in the door. Comes on stage in Manchester in the represent stuff. I'm glad that all that happened because I learned from it so much because it got to a point where it was like, it's either make or break. We were, we were either doing this now or it's going to crash. George, how are we doing? Great, thanks. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. What do you think of Edinburgh? First time up in a while. Yeah, absolutely love it. We've had an amazing day. We have. I, I've firmly said to several people already that I have never, ever experienced the Pentlands like that this morning. And I think for you, as somebody who spends a lot of time in the Peak District, I'm quite proud that I've managed to show you the best feature of Edinburgh with nobody else around. <laughs> yeah, no, it's beautiful. So I grew up in Edinburgh. I love it here. I've spent some time away. I'm back. And I'm back for reasons that are close to me. You grew up in the Northwest. You're still in the Northwest. What was it like growing up there? Um, as, a, as a kid, I didn't like it. I kind of resented it. Um, just because myself and my brother were so different to everyone else there. Um, I didn't really start exploring it until I was a lot older and a lot wiser. And a lot, I realized how much of a nice place it actually is. And what I can do, like we just mentioned earlier about going up into the mountains and just exploring. So it took me a long while to start to love it, but I do love it now. Would you be anywhere else? Yeah, I've, I've got a few things planned. I'm, I'm never going to stick around. Like I go away a lot. Every two weeks, I'm usually away somewhere. Um, and I love Los Angeles. I'm sure anyone listening to this who's listened to me before, I talk about it a lot. So you were different growing up, you and Mike. Yeah. Why? Um, we were just like culture, culturally un unfit into the environment. Like all my friends and everyone in our school were into, it was like tracksuits, shaved heads, TNs. Me and Mike were like, we had this, west coast skate look we wore we had our long hair we wore oversized tees skinny jeans vans we would skate around where we could even though the concrete doesn't really allow you to where we are um so we just it was just we had a different a different outlook on life that didn't match where we where we grew up i guess when did that outlier existence start to manifest into thinking we're a bit more creative we've got these thoughts that ultimately became represent because you started when you were 19 yeah i was 19 uh way before that like early teens mike was my inspiration and his inspiration was what he'd find on youtube what he'd look at on the tv like whether it was heavy metal bands or pro skaters all our inspiration came from that whole setting and i guess it was like a like like an environment we wanted to be in that we weren't in. So you created it for yourself, essentially? Yeah, I guess so. So the confidence to be able to do that when you got to the age of 19 must have come from somewhere because obviously you had each other. You had the setting you grew up in. I can imagine it must have been challenging with the tracksuits and the skinheads and you being different and all the things that go with that. But parents growing up, I know your dad's a very hardworking man. You're still very well connected with him. He's still very hardworking, yeah. loves what he does. But what influence did your parents have on you to give you the confidence to move towards starting what has ultimately become something rather insane? Yeah, I think it was there was two different dynamics from my mum and dad. My dad was like all about the grit, hard work, physical labor. And my mum was a mum who would come and sit on the end of my bed every night and be like, George, you're gonna make you're gonna make it. You're gonna do really well in life. I don't know what it is you're gonna be. You're very creative, like I know you're gonna do well. So she was kind of like instilling this confidence into my brain that I, something's going to happen. I was going to do something with my life. Whereas my dad was kind of teaching me the lessons of discipline, the lessons of grit, the lessons of determination, the lessons of actually putting the work will get you somewhere. How did the next steps unfold then? Because discipline, grit, hard work are all things that are integral to 
the lifestyle you lead now, the persona you have online, the brand, the business, and everything from the top down. But at 19 years old, the confidence to be able to go out and actually say, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to make it a business with a supply chain that needs managed. And I'm going to do this my brother. We're going to go our own way is a bold thing to do. Was it confidence in the idea? Was it a desire to not work for anyone else? Was it total faith in your and Mike's abilities that came from your mom saying you're going to make it? What was the spark that really thought this is what we should do and this is not the time that we should do it? I can't put a defining factor on it, but I can tell you that like all of them little things all amounted to what it would be. Um, back then it was, let's just sell t-shirts to our friends and then they'll sell them to their friends and then it'll start rolling. I didn't set out a five-year plan or a 10-year plan or, or imagine the business to be at a certain size by then. It was just about how do I get out of this educational system and working for my dad at night? Like what is the, the way I can do something different? What were the early stages like? Because starting a business for those listening might be something they aspire to do. It's intimidating. The longer you wait, in my opinion, the more intimidating it can become because responsibilities grow, yeah. mortgages get bigger, interest rates at the moment aren't very friendly. Kids come along and you get locked into a way of living that becomes difficult to exit. But you're in a very unique position where you've you've jumped in straight away before apprenticeships before grad schemes before all the things that a lot of people that enter the working world find themselves in yeah and you've had to build the wings as you fly so initial challenges what were the harshest lessons that you learned fast um lessons that i learned fast okay yeah. just to like uh not be so emotionally attached to things like even though it is still all my life like 100 percent of my energy goes into building the brand one way or another whether it's through myself through my brother through 247 but like back then I was so emotionally attached to how people would conversate and how suppliers would deal with our stuff. And like back then it was, it was more of like my back was constantly against the wall. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the backing. I didn't have any advice from anyone on what to do. So it was every single step, everything, every single idea, every single challenge that came ahead. Like I was shooting in the dark. There was no blueprint. There was no mentor. There was no one to tell me what to do. Um, so I guess I just learned over the years and it's been a long time. Like this never just all of a sudden blew up. Like it's been 12 years now. Initial back against the wall situations, no blueprint and everything that's followed. How did you process that emotionally as the kid that was different to everybody else growing up? Because... I know you've spoken openly and, and you, you live a very, very disciplined, rigid existence now, which is completely passion led and that's completely evident to all. But from a self doubt, from a trying to prove things to others point of view, did you, did, did you ever feel that there was a sense of inadequacy trying to prove things to others that was moving you forwards when you had your back up against the wall? Yeah, definitely. Like at the start, it was always, I wanted to prove to my dad that I didn't have to work for him. I wanted to prove to my granddad, like the things that he said was not true and what what we could actually become from selling our own art um and then yeah it was just like how do i get better than this guy how do i like you're always uh comparing yourself especially at a young age to other people and i wanted to i wanted to be successful in my own right and i wanted to show my family what i could do i wanted to provide for my whole family and i wanted to just be the best version of myself there's several steps on the ladder to get yeah, to the point. Yeah, it's had a very like... Some big ones. <laughs> it's, it's had a very slow, long and weird curve, but then it, it kind there's, of... There's big up. spikes, aren't there? Yeah. But the thing is, there's always been the spike and then the people have stayed. Right. And then 2019, which we'll come on to, was the spike, which went stratospheric. Yeah. And it, it's only going one direction now. But early days, by the sounds of things you were making up as you go along, you and Mike were just trying to prove to your granddad and your dad that you could sell T-shirts yeah. and that you didn't need to go... <laughs> and refurbish disabled minivans or whatever it is <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. And there were a few things that happened early doors that were completely unfathomable, really, weren't there? I mean, Justin Bieber is the big example that moved things forward. Yeah. And that's not in any blueprint anywhere. That will probably never happen again for any other brand. So do you want to talk us through the, the sort of key initial moments that really got the brand out there? Yeah, I mean, like, the if I go really far back, the first one was a band called Rizzle Kicks, if you remember those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I met them guys at a little festival in Wales and I give them some caps and they wore them on the stage and it was like, okay, sick. There's 400 people watching this. S some of them will buy the brand. We put a little stall up at that 
like event that was on tie dyed some t-shirts sold them around had the caps there and that like got our name out a little bit and then they wore it on tv and it was like okay this is like uk national television and we have absolutely zero capital so we can't spend to put on there but our name is on there so that was like the first step then you'd start seeing names come in on the big cartel orders that you didn't know so it was like okay it's not just friends and friends of friends buying this anymore people are starting to buy it and over that like course of the first three four years i was obviously heavily into like mac miller's music he was a massive idol of mine um and he was touring in manchester and i felt that was an opportunity for me to put represent on him one way or another if i could get it on him and i'm not one of them guys that will go and and try and do things like that but i just felt at the time like my clothes were cool and he's cool and i love his music surely he'll love the clothes and um i just sent a message to his manager on twitter and i was like oh can i can i pull up to the tour bus and give you these clothes he's like yeah yeah pull up chuck some clothes in the door comes on stage in manchester in the represent stuff puts it as his profile picture the next day and then he was down in london like two days later and he was like oh Mac wants you to come on the bus. So I was like, okay, sick. So <laughs> jumped on this bus, met Mac. That was such a cool thing because, like, then not only is it on national TV in like all over the UK with Rizzle Kicks, then you've got Mac Miller, who's put it as his profile picture on Instagram, which was new at the time, and Twitter. And it says represent across his swear. So then more people started buying it and we got like a little bit of traction in the US and across Europe. And that kind of snowballed a little bit of like capital into the back where I could actually start doing things that I wanted to do. And it wasn't just a t-shirt and a sweater with represent across it. What does represent actually mean to you? In the beginning, it, it didn't really mean anything. It was just a cool word that like it, it was, it was a cool word that I, I loved and it looked, it looked great when I'd written it out, whether it was a script or whether it was in a, in a font and I think over the years, like I fell out of love with it for a while, but then I fell back in love with it. And then I realized like, it, I, I guess it's uh, an abbreviation of us. Like we're representing ourselves. We're like represent is who we are as a brand and as people. And I guess that's what the, the name means now. And that's why now, if we fast forward, obviously we'll, we'll paint the picture as we go, but everything is so brand campaign, visual people, ethos, value led. Yeah. So it really feels that the brand from the inside out is being represented outwardly. Yeah, exactly. And I know like the word community gets thrown a lot around a lot, but it's really like such a communal brand, whether it's the team in the headquarters or the customers that love buying it that become friends through it and stuff like that. Like it's all very communal. And if we just go back to the Mac Miller situation, the message that really stands out to me there is essentially backing yourself. Yeah, because you did something that a lot of people wouldn't think was even possible to do, which is just have a pop, give it a go, send the message, see what happens. And I think it's more common these days. People people know that you can, you can go out there and give things a go, but ultimately business, taking risks, that's what that is all about. And that one risk to just put yourself out there because there's a lot of pride attached to it. So what if you'd said no? Exactly. Yeah. You, might, you might have felt horrible. You might have thought, oh, my clothes are terrible. I'm a bad person. Oh, Mac Miller doesn't know. I didn't get through to the person. I backed myself. I thought I would. And that was a risk that you took, but you took it. Yeah. And then not only was he wearing your clothes, not only was the name that you'd chosen front and center, but you met somebody cool. You met somebody you admired. Yeah. And I guess back then, like when I was, like I was pretty much a kid then. He was a kid as well. And like we had shared interests and I loved his music. He loved the clothes that like now the, the, the a like the age we live in is so different with social media you can pretty much reach out to anyone right and it's not so uncommon to get your clothes on somebody or a lot of brands will pay different influencers artists whatever it is to but back then it was it was literally the start of that whole social media thing um so it was a lot i guess it was a lot more difficult to do it but at the same time when you did do it it was very impactful and that was stage one of, of many of these spikes that came along. Yeah. And then Justin Bieber was the, the one that there's been many along the way. But I, I'd say the next ring in the ladder that has always stood out to me is just the ridiculousness of you guys rolling <laughs> up to where he was staying and everybody thinking it was him. And yeah. it was just you being like, just delivering some clothes, don't worry. Yeah, that was a crazy day. 
what was the what was the situation there? Because again, it was it was a risk that you took to try and make something happen, and it happened again. Yeah. Well, actually, it was my friends that owned a bar called Tattoo in Manchester, and they invited Bieber there because he was performing that night, and they just opened the restaurant and bar up, and they invited us down just as like guests to fill the bar out whilst he was coming in. Um, like so, it wasn't just full of random people that would ask Bieber for pictures. And we were just at the bar and obviously we're all head to toe in rap. Like the full crew was out, six of us or something at that time. And he walked in and he loved, he was like, what, what high is that you're wearing? And like, what's this? And then James, the guy who works for me, was like, I'll take you, take my number, gave it to the security guard. They exchanged a few things. And then the next minute we're pulling up at his house with a boot full of clothes and he wore it for the rest of the tour. It's absolutely mad to think, isn't it? Because from that point onwards, that's been a real core part of the brand DNA. And the collaborative side of that has become one of the most exciting things about what you do. And from yeah. a design point of view, how creatively fulfilling was it when those relationships with Matt Miller, with Justin Bieber, started to become things that you could actually build in collaboration with them? Because, correct me if I'm wrong, but Mike's a bit more of the back-end design, yeah. deep thinker, profound thinker. You're a bit mm -hmm. more of the front-end living a lifestyle, representing the brand, but very much focusing on product and bringing the product to life. Right. So when it comes to most recently Motley Crue, you've done a collaboration with Motley Crue. Sick. Not many people have done that, if no. anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a case of when you started getting the opportunity, how did that personally feel from a reward point of view? Did you actually get a chance to look back and think this is unbelievable that we are working with people like this and we're actually not doing things the way that anybody else is? from a creative fulfillment point of view. Yeah, a hundred percent. It felt great. And it feels great that like people of that state status and that amount of wealth will wear represent over brands. They can be paid millions for or brands that are really expensive. Like if, if Bieber can go in his closet and choose represent over Prada, Gucci, Dior, all these other brands that will happily pay him to wear it. Like that's the best feeling to know that you're on them guys or them girls and they're choosing to wear it and still to this day when when a celebrity will pop up and wear it or like someone of high influence or just like podcasters whoever it is that i'll be watching on tv and it'll be like oh shit they're wearing rap like they they're choosing to do that is that's the best feeling for me i think i feel like i'm doing something right when that happens has that feeling always been as intense now as it has been from the start yeah definitely still feel like Nas wore it on stage whilst he sang Represent last week. And it's like, that's one of them moments where you kind of dream that happens and then it happens. It's like, well, that, that's Com completely organic. Really cool. Just yeah. had the clothes, didn't know, saw him on stage. Yeah, amazing, amazing. So we spoke earlier on the hills about there was a point 2018, 2019, just before the brand started to go insane, where you actually didn't feel like you were that happy with who you are as a person. Yeah, definitely. And there's a lot that's happened to make you the person that everybody sees online now and the the front runner for the brand and essentially what 24-7, 247 is all about yeah. when it comes to the lifestyle side of things is living a 24-7 lifestyle. And do you want to just talk us through the, the years in between Rizzle Kicks and the point where you decided something had to change from a personal point of view because you've got a lot on your shoulders. As you said, you're a kid got these crazy opportunities and the stress of crazy opportunities whether good or bad is still stress it's still something you've got to process isn't it you've got yeah. to manage that with the people around you so who would you become when you decided that you needed to make a change and what happened along the way to make you think oh, it's time to move on i guess i had this like gradual incline of like wealth the brand getting bigger everyone like finding out about the brand and it becoming a thing but i wasn't going at that same rate with my mental health or my ability to actually be a businessman or my ability to lead a team or anything like that. Like I wasn't self-developing, but the brand was growing at like a good incline. It wasn't growing crazy. If it would have grown crazy, it would have been come straight falling back down, but it grew to a point where I could still handle it. But it, like you said, in 2018, 19, I, I, a trigger happened where like I'd like for the, the, you, a few years before that, there was like times where we were out every weekend. We were getting drunk three times a week. We were like having bad relationships. The, the business wasn't running well. Like we weren't focusing our efforts in the right places because we thought like, okay, it's great. It's doing well. Like 
this this is cool like we kind of took a back seat on the wrong, on the right things which was such a bad mistake but i'm glad that all that happened because i learned from it so much because it got to a point where it was like it's either make or break we were we were either doing this now or it's gonna crash and it got so deep into that point like my friends who had been in the business from the start some of them left um with the team size went down so small revenue dropped my profits dropped and then like i was so caught up in other things that i didn't realize it was happening so when when it kind of got to this point where like a realization I, I was i was just sat on my own for a while and i realized that like i didn't know who i was personally um and how i looked and everything like that just wasn't what i wanted to be so i kind of just drew a picture of what i wanted to become who i wanted to become where where i'll see myself in the next 10 years and i know it sounds cliche but i actually like i the way i communicate things to myself is by drawing it out or i'll use my notes like i draw everything and i, I scribble things so i just kind of like pictured myself as this guy that i actually wanted to be not who i was then um, and I had to really dig deep on like self-development. I had to read a lot of books. I had to learn a lot about business whilst I was trying to turn the business back over into something that was once again successful. Um, and through doing that, I guess I, I leaned into it so much that it became my passion again, whereas I'd lost it for the past few few years. Like I said, we'd, we'd put it all on a back seat. We'd taken all these different trips around the world, doing fun stuff, making it look cool, but behind the scenes, it wasn't cool. And you were doing things for other people in many ways, weren't you? Because I know you've gone through the wheelhouse of trying the fast cars, doing all the bad things that yeah. come with being a young young guy with with money to play with. Definitely. And it's out of your system now, but along the way you'll have learned some valuable lessons that make you a more informed version of who you are. And ultimately when you went to scribble down in your notes, who do I want to be? You had that information to go with it. So the self-development piece that you were accidentally working through through figuring out the business just because people like the perceivable jumps from a business perspective, what were the things that got you as a brand from five figures to six figures a month? And then beyond that, what were the things that got you from six to seven? Um, I don't know. That was like really at the start going from like five to seven figures was quite early on. Um, and that was just about product offering and having the stock to be able to do it. Um, and then obviously Facebook ads came along, Instagram uh, like appeared and everyone started using that. So the actual ascent from like six to seven figures was really easy. Which makes the lessons learned. Not even seem like lessons because they weren't really there. You you, just, you're, you almost got a, a fast pass, which means that you didn't have the ability to, to see how you got there to then apply right. it to the next stage in many ways, didn't you? Right. Which is so, almost why you and, found yourself in that position, yeah. Yeah, and 2016 to 2019, we were stuck. Like, the revenue was flat. The business was flat. Like, we'd, we'd grown through the first five, six years of the brand, and then we just flattened off, and I couldn't figure out because I didn't understand what I actually needed to do for all that time, how we would get to the next step. Or if there even was a next step, like I didn't know like where we could grow with the business. I thought we was doing the right things and the right, making the right decisions. And it just wasn't true. Was your identity directly correlated with the performance of the business in that period? Yeah, a hundred percent. Is it still now? Um, no, the brand is way bigger than what I am. Like I, I'm just a, like a tool to help it grow, I guess. So 2019 things changed yeah aggressively yeah <laughs> it's fair to say what was the what if there is a moment what was the what was a period of time where you started to get the feeling that things were going and then the trajectory is just gone year on year from that point correct me if I'm wrong but financial year forecast this year as you've said recently is 80 million we're looking at and 2019 was at seven in that year so between now and then the trajectory has been insane and it took you from it, what best part seven years to the, to get to that point yeah what happened well there was like a like i said there was a breaking point where it was like we either do this or we don't me mike james steph the boys that are still in the business now sat down and we were like we mapped out a whole new plan and we spent the back end of 2018 and half of 2019 just really like changing everything so it was like down to suppliers down to fabrics down to the shows we were showing at down to cutting off 
like doing runways, down to changing our wholesale platform, down to going to direct to consumer only for a while. And it these all were all things that were risks, right? But there were risks that we had to take because if we didn't take them, we would stay flat. Like we were manufacturing everything in the UK till 2018, where the, the suppliers couldn't handle the production that we'd want to do if we wanted to double our revenue. And the price points for the product that we were making, we were losing money at wholesale anyway. So why, like we were doing it wrong, like everything, even though it says made in Britain, it wasn't great. Like the, the production value you get out of Britain is nowhere near what you can get in other countries. Um, and even though the whole made in Britain essence, and I'm sure it's the same, made in the USA, it's, it's nowhere near as fast forward and well executed as countries that are really leveraging production to actually become huge e economies based on that. Did you make the decision to change based on the few scenarios where the actual product that went out to market wasn't what you hoped it would be? Yeah, the product wasn't great. The product was taking too long to make. And the the work that was put into every single product was way too much for what it should have been. Like we wanted to do vintage wash hoodies. We would have to go and get the fabric from one mill, drive it to a production house that had stitched it up, then drive it to a wash house that had, that had dye it. But then it'd shrink. So then you'd have to then resize it for a different label. Then it'd go to another place to get printed. They'd charge you extra to put it in a bag. But then it comes to your warehouse. And like the the whole cycle of that adds up that you don't realize like every single 50p or pound or whatever it is, just transport cost and labeling costs and bagging costs adds so much onto it that then when you're going out to a wholesale partner and they're asking for discount and you're like, okay, yeah, take 10% discount on this if you're going to order X amount you're making zero money and we just didn't realize that for so many years there was round of jackets that went out weren't there that you had to almost recall and apologize that was, for. that was a long time ago <laughs> that was, was it was that was that was that before then yeah before the decision so so you had that lesson i had that lesson stuck many with times. the british made yeah for, for a long period of time mm -hmm. so was it just that 2019 overhaul as a business where you took the decision enough's enough we're moving it elsewhere and then the the journey to to make that happen began yeah so we spent like a lot of time in portugal and it was a completely different system to how we were manufacturing so usually i'd have pattern cutters in-house that would make samples um and then we'd take it down to the factory in birmingham we'd refit it we'd redo it in an actual fabric mock it up see how it does that would take so long because there's so much physical effort in it and james who's now the chief product officer was like let's just try Portugal. Everyone says it's the best thing. Everyone says we need to do our jersey there. We need to do our pants there. And I had so many bad like arguments with him and we were, we were so immature at the time. And I, I just didn't believe it was right. Like I didn't believe it was the right thing that actually everything can be done off measurements and prototypes, not all made by hand in, in the office, which is how I originally loved it. Um, but we knocked that on the head and that was a, such a long process. That was like nearly a year of us not having stock because we don't want to do the English stuff and we're trying this Portuguese stuff that's taking so long. We're trying to figure out all these factories. They don't want to work with us because we're so small. They don't know who we are because we've just come into the country. It's like you, you're in this battle and eventually you get out of this battle where you can order a lot more. All the other factories start talking about you. Then they all want you. Then you've got the leverage on all of them and now it's like every single factory in Portugal wants to work with represent. So they're all fighting for it. They're all giving us the best product possible. And we've got amazing partners now. And that wouldn't have happened if James wouldn't have come to me and said, look, let's try this. So along the way, team members have been an enormous part of the whole process. James obviously yeah. figured that out along the way. You, you and Mike have been the team the whole way through. You've been the core. What point did you relinquish top end control and bring in a CEO? And when did you start to actually be a bit more tactical and strategic about board level discussions, senior leadership team? Because up until 2019, you were a team of six or seven, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I think we, it's now we dropped 17. back down to eight just before COVID. Wow. Um, and that was, again, that was about streamlining the business so we could actually do other things. We went, going back to that, we weren't, we focused on our online. We knew we had a lot of customers there. They just weren't buying from us because we weren't doing the right things. We were trying to be a different brand. We were trying to do runways. We were trying to be technical trying to do too many things, listening to too many people in the wrong areas. So yeah, we came back to our, our roots, started putting things online. COVID happened. We were like, okay, most factories are shut down here. Let's find the ones that are still working. 
and let's get product in from them that we can do pretty easily. Easy t-shirts. Mike can do amazing graphics. Let's put some graphics on these tees. Let's imitate the vintage rock tees. And we put some online on like a Friday and they sold out. And then we did next Friday and they sold out. And then we doubled it next Friday and they sold out. And then it became this thing where we were all just like, something here is actually like really catching on. And uh, we did like a series of 10 tees originally for the first 10 weeks of COVID. And then we restocked them all and it just blew up the website. It was like, right, we're, we're on something here. The eyes are on us. Everyone's getting these orders next day in the middle of COVID because our warehouse is still working. Um, and everyone's tagging it on Instagram. There's so many eyes on the brand. Now we can actually like re rebuild what the brand's DNA is and start really designing some really cool product. Um, and that, that there was the turning point where the brand exploded. And that was, luckily that was like a year into COVID. So I had a year of just being able to clear my mind, listen to podcasts, read books, talk to Mike all day. Didn't have the stress of business, didn't have the stress of like a huge team on my shoulders and me trying to navigate through things without knowing what I'm doing. There was no fashion weeks on, so we couldn't even do a fashion show. So we'd knocked that on the head. Stores were all canceling their orders with other brands. So it was like, okay, we don't need to do wholesale. Let's just leave it for a while. Um, Built the brand through them two years or so. Got it to such a huge level from where it was that we looked back and was like, right, stores are opening up now. All the factories are reopening. Everyone's coming to us. Every single store in every single country wants to represent. Whereas back before that, it was like, oh, will, will you take represent on? Like, okay, we'll give you this order, but we want this discount and we're only going to pay you in 90 days. Whereas now it's like, we're, we've got the leverage. So they're coming to us. They're desperate for represent. They're selling out of the product. Okay, so now we can increase our global, I say lighthouse, because all these stores are lighthouses for us. They'll all get a select amount of products. We'll put it in there. People will go in, look at it and be like, oh shit, this is amazing product and it's good price. Like when we go on the website, they'll come on the website, see such a big collection and see the prestige system, get involved with the community, they see the Facebook groups and the Instagram accounts. And that's where we're at now. We're just at this place where everyone wants to represent and we're making the right product. And at the core of all that, throughout that process you've just run through was your personal transformation, the decisions you made, the person you wanted to be, the notes that you took. Just talk us through that from a fitness point of view, because I know you through, you've, you've gone through your own, as I have, evolution of fitness yeah. over the years. We've both been out of breath meatheads at points in our life. <laughs> <laughs> and at certain points today, we were out of breath meatheads yet again. Yeah. But we've had fun, we've had fun today, and we were we were dynamic in several ways, might I add. Done a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, so I think... Fastest 5K. Yeah. <laughs> so what actions did you take? Because you mentioned the person you want to be conceptually, but what actually happened? What was the action you took next? Because I think to give it context, you have reinvented a brand that was doing well, hit a dip. You took a conscious decision, right? Let's fucking change this. Yeah. Reinvent everything. Myself, my physical, my personal, my brother, my team, and my brand. If we can reinvent everything and put it up to a level of where we're way more satisfied with it, then we can start expressing ourselves more. Like I hated being behind a camera way like before that. I didn't like pictures getting taken with edit stuff all the time. And then when I decided, right, like I want to look like this, then I went and did it. Spent so much time running, so much time lifting, so much time figuring out different programs that I could use, so much time looking at nutrition and diets. Like, and again, this was like 2019, 2020, 2021. And I saw the change in my body and like my physique and my mental clarity and the stop drinking and I've just changed my whole way of living to this more disciplined person that would, it was business first, then it was, well, no, I'd say business, family, fitness, all three at the same time, but everything correlated to business. And if I can put everything into that business, which is family and fitness anyway, then that was kind of like where 247 came about. And that was a key moment along the way, wasn't it? Because we were up in the yeah. Bentlands today discussing the moment where one, you actually found a love for running because we were up and had a cloud inversion up in the hills. It was, as I've said, it was stunning. Unlike yeah. anything I've ever had local to ever yeah. in my life. And I've been here a long time. So talk us through that moment because you're running around the reservoir close to you. Yeah. And an idea formed, didn't it? It did, yeah. I was with Mike, my brother, and we were running 
up in the hills, lovely. Like it was so hot in that, that 2020 summer. And I was like, why am I wearing a Nike pant? Why are you not wearing a represent pant? Like, what, what are we missing here? Like the whole mission was always to create the wardrobe for ourselves. And now we're getting into fitness. There's nothing that is represent that will work for this. So like we went back to the office that night and I kind of wrote up a little plan of like all these different aspects of different pants that I like that I want to put into a represent pant. And it was like, okay, I love the fit of this Nike pant. I love the fabric of this Lululemon pant. I love the military pocket on our best selling pant. I love the way the the finishing is on this pant because I have to tuck this other Nike pant into my sock. So let's put this finishing on it. Drew this pant out on a piece of paper on a board and we just thought like, right, let's try it. Let's figure out the fabric, sent it to the factory in Birmingham again and uh, ordered 300 of them, I think it was, for the first order and made a little campaign video that I thought was nothing really. It was just us going out, going for a run, coming to the office, going to the gym, getting back home at night. But throughout that video with each different uh, dynamic of life, we were in the same pant and it just exploded. The video exploded, the pants sold out in a second. We tripled the order, the pants sold out in a second. We then moved the order to a much more technical factory in the Far East because we had some issues with the first ones and production quantities. And we ordered just so much that could last us six months at the rate that it was selling at. And that's when we realized, ah, we can sell way more products than what we're doing because we're selling things out and then the demand is still there, but we're not supplying the demand. So that was the first product that allowed us to supply demand. And it's your hero product now, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. It sells every every day. It's our bread and butter. And is that across both businesses? Represent and yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. both businesses, both strands of the business. Yeah, product, best seller. That and like an owners club hoodie in black is our best selling pieces. So, two four seven essentially represents that transformation you went through and the action you take, the reinvention, and the habits that got you to the point where you had this moment of clarity. For anyone listening, that's thinking. I'd love to be able to reinvent myself. I'd love to be able to, able to overhaul my life and, and have that clarity, find that clarity. What would you recommend that they do? What were the processes that you went through? Who were the people that influenced you? What were the things that influenced you? What were the habits that you focused on to start that process of transformation? All right. Well, there was a few different catalysts. One was Andy Fritzella, 75 hard. I found out about this through a friend and... It seemed like the right thing to do at the time for me. I was already running. I was already training. I was already in this like business mindset of just working on my goals. And that there, the the little aspects that are inside of that, the training twice a day, the drinking X amount of water, the no alcohol, the sticking to a diet. These were like little disciplines that I could just add into my life that would then give me more time to do what I wanted to do and less time to think about them other things that then I've got to cut out. There was no alcohol, so that meant I'm not going out, right? There was sticking to a diet, so that meant I'm not going out for dinner either. Then there was like training twice a day, so I've got to wake up early. I've got to then train after I, I've finished my work as well. So all these little things I just put into my life that for me, the, the 75 hard thing wasn't difficult because I was already like 80% of the way there. It just made me realize that if I go 100%, rather than 80%, I can do so much more with my day, with my life. I can become such a better person. Um, and I did that a couple of times. And through his podcast, I started listening to other people. Um, then there was a guy called Ed Milet that has such like a optimistic way of looking at life. So I thought like, why am I always pessimistic about everything? Why do I never believe in anything that I do? like switch that let's change that let's wake up let's be happy let's be grateful let's think about the right things put that in there then books i would read like i was i was getting into that like disciplinary like i don't know i don't know how to say it like um self-discovery mindset so like atomic habits was such a, an iconic book and it, it, i think it has been for everyone that has that like discipline that again, just reassured me what I was doing with like 75 hard and how I was looking at the outlook of life was the right thing. And then I found out about Ryan Holiday. I listened, read all his books and then it was like, okay, I'm reading like so many different books here that are all affirmations of the same thing. 
they all lead to the same result. And even though they're spoke by different people in different eras and different times by that have gone through all these different businesses or lives, they all kind of say the same thing. So if we, if I can implement that same thing into me and it proves successful, then can I give that energy off through my personal pages and change other people's lives? What is that thing? Is it simply discipline? I think it is. I think discipline is like the root of success. I really do think it is. Do you think discipline in and of itself is the root or do you think discipline within the framework of a direction? Because you you had the business, you had the vision for who you wanted to be, you were pointed towards that and discipline got you there. But if somebody's not pointed anywhere, would you give them different advice? I, yeah, I think I would. I think that if, if someone has zero plan, zero future planned out for the, and ahead of them, they don't need to just implement discipline into their life. They don't need to go out and run 10K a day for 70 days or train twice and drink this much water and do this. I think they need to take the first little step, whether that's trying to figure out what it is that you want to do. What are you actually good at? Everyone's good at something, right? If you can leverage that one thing and make it become your life, eventually it will lead to success. And I'm sure like you can, I'm sure everyone can be successful in, in a field of what they do. It, I don't know what the timelines are on that. It could be 50 years, it could be 10 years, it could be one year. You see like singers blow up after six months of singing, but you'll see a business person like me blow up after 12 years, or you'll see a, a businessman that sells cars and it'll take him 35 years. There's no timeline for it. It's just about taking that first step, whether that first step is reading a book, mental health going for a run like whatever that thing is just just give it a go just try it see if you can stack it up and if you enjoy it keep going at it specific example on this we discussed earlier was machine gun kelly you've done collab stuff with in the past and you you were there in 2019 when he essentially had one of his best albums that didn't go where he hoped it would before the rise that's followed and that's a great example of somebody who's been chipping away and away and away and away yeah. and away. And if you picked him up now or you saw him on TikTok for the first time recently and you you just... You wouldn't realize you that, You wouldn't right? realize, would you? He's had such like a long career. No one realized like he started rapping when I started my brand. And we kind of grew together at this same level for so long. And then both like exploded at the same time. But it's because he spent so long trying to figure out what his direction was and how he could do things and how he could target the masses, I guess. And like the, ev everyone is different, right? Everyone's gonna take different routes and go down different paths and fail and fail and try again and fail and, and eventually it'll lead to success. And he is a good indicator of that. Like if you even go down my Instagram from, if you scroll down for three, four years, it's not the same person. People are looking at me like, whoa, what the fuck? That's not the same guy. Which is like, you can tell a story through images right or video youtube whatever it is you can go back in time and see the actual come up of people and it's completely different to what you see now and the reason i brought him up is because he's in a tier of celebrity now that people put on a pedestal and they believe that they're not like the person that they believe themselves to be yeah. they're unattainable that they've had advantages that they might not have Whereas the core of what you've discussed there from a personal point of view and with him, and actually you've met some of the most famous people on the planet on a regular basis. And what's at the core of all that, as you've mentioned, is the fact that people just stick out what they're passionate about, yeah. implement the discipline along the way, and it'll figure itself out because passion is what's guiding you forwards. Discipline will almost help build the bridge as you go. But finding the thing that you're passionate about is what I think a lot of people are struggling with these days. And I'd love to hear your opinions on specifically with younger men, because I think the way the internet is going, there's a lot of stuff out there at the moment that's telling you to do X, suggesting you do Y, encouraging you to consider things in a way in which five years ago, you wouldn't have been encouraged yeah. to do so. So based on the journey you've been on, the people you've met, the things that you've seen, lessons you've learned over the years, what would your advice be to young men in this day and age? It's a difficult question because everything is perceived differently, right? But I noticed that and I noticed that 
a 20 year old kid can come on Instagram and look at these guys that own brands and look at their cars and look at their lifestyle that aren't much older than them and think that will that'll never be me but like the the, the difficulty is like the, everything takes so long people just need to realize that like you, you can't just have everything at once i think you can have anything but you can't have everything so it's like I, to to say to say to a young kid like oh you need to go and find your passion is extremely difficult because for me i already knew what i wanted to do all my life like i wanted to make art if i could then sell that it was translating it to clothes i figured that out at a young age so i don't have a great opinion on someone who comes to me at 20 years old and says how do i find my passion it's it's a difficult question to answer it's something i think about a lot as well like, I, I, what I, do you answer to a, a kid that asks you that look internally because i think back to when i was that age and suffering it was because i was looking externally for things to guide me in the right direction whilst simultaneously ignoring all of the things that i knew would actually make me happy but i felt that the process of achieving the things that i thought i should be doing would make me happy because it was one step higher in the ladder right but i think the ladder has changed since i felt like that i think that the sort of more corporate traditional structure has been done away with a bit and i think if you're really really in on social media and you're seeing short form content promoting join my telegram group for forex trading this so you can buy an aventador etc all this stuff that's just rife at the moment and the schemes that we know that go on behind yeah. all of it to allow people to present these lifestyles it's almost presented this really fast paced fuck the ladder figure it out yourself mentality which i'm actually concerned that were i myself in my younger years now i would have interacted with even worse than i would have done then yeah because that's, i think it would have put even more pressure on me and that's why it's hard to answer that question because like everything is out there on your phone on your laptop like you can see everything and what everyone's doing and it's it's kind of like instant everything's short form everything's instant and you can like it's almost attainable to you but it's not it's so far away but you can see that other people have it so you think you can get it quick um i think really you've just got to actually listen to the right people follow the right people like there is so many inspiring people out there and if you have a bad group of friends or you don't have a friend group like you can go on instagram and you can follow the right the set right people that are doing things that you want to be doing in say 10 15 years and you can learn from them you can listen to them on podcasts you can watch them on youtube you can read their books like that's how you can understand that nothing's gonna be instant nothing's gonna be gratified straight away like there's there's a path to everything that's very, that's long form and you just got to accept that how important is being an uncle to you um pretty important actually yeah like and I, I never thought i'd like want a child um and now you know my sister's pearl is two and a half like i actually love her like she's my own child um which is incredible i love it yeah i love being an uncle and there seems to be a business reflection of this as yeah about 26 and a half hours from now yeah you'll be releasing the first <laughs> round of kids stuff on yeah there. is that um, something you want to see develop for the for, for i don't know the child like, that you want in the future i've kind of realized that even going back to just what we we're saying then like everything's so short form and quick and you can change anything like with with represent i can do what i want like if if something doesn't work it doesn't work move on nobody actually cares because everything's so fast and i thought oh i'll make pearl some little samples last year and then i put it on instagram and it just absolutely blew up and then i realized like okay everyone around my age is kind of having kids now like my sister's having kids james is having kids in the business is like babies popping up everywhere let's let's just see if like you're back to your roots aren't you you're selling t-shirts to, to your <laughs> mates and your friends and your friends yeah <laughs> <laughs> um the instagram post blew up so i was like should we just make these james and he was like yeah let's try it long long story short nine months later it's coming out we're, we're trying it what do you, how do you think it'll land i don't know according to the reaction for instagram it should do phenomenal but i like i've never sold kids clothes before and who's to say the reaction on instagram relates to sales 
most of the time it does with the brand, but that's because my customers are buying it. Whereas my, my customers aren't necessarily buying this unless they have a child or someone in the family that's that, that young. And it's only, I only wanted to do age one to four because I don't want to do kids clothes. I don't want to do seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I don't want like the average rest, represent customer to be walking down the street and see a young 12 year old yeah. in the same clothes with him. I want it to be their family, their children. Yeah. Makes for good uh, good studio pictures, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a hard graft, actually. <laughs> <laughs> With all that in mind, given you're so value driven, given you're so purpose driven, given you've you've held yourself accountable to so many things, and you're really thinking towards the future now from a business and a personal point of view, what sort of father, hypothetically speaking, do you want to be, and what are the values that you're really going to hold close to you? I want to be like my dad was to me. Like he taught me how to how to nurture grit, how to practice discipline, how to work hard and like how real the world is and how fake other people are. Like he taught me all that stuff when I was like young and I didn't realize that was happening um, because you don't when you're a kid. You just listen to him and think, what, what, what's he going on about? Or why is he making me do this? Or why am I stood power hose in a minibus on a Wednesday night? Like the, he taught me all those things, whether he knew it or not for like a really good reason. And I'll be the exact same with my children. With that as the core, what does a day-to-day look like from a habits point of view? Because I can imagine your DMs are peppered with several things, but mostly, bro, what trainers are those? <laughs> bro, what's your morning routine? Bro, what's your recovery protocol? What's your what morning is routine? day-to-day? Full, full day? Full day, let's do full it. Day. Yeah, yeah, full right. day. I'll wake up usually around 10 to 5. All right. Quarter to 5, 10 to 5, 5 to 5. Whichever one of them five minute slots is right for when I go to bed. And before we carry on with the day, I go to bed eight hours before that. I do not, I'm not one of them guys that will do four hours sleep or five hours sleep. Like I make sure I'm in bed eight hours before I wake up. We say having both oh. done that today. <laughs> yeah. Well, when there's an important task at hand, then I'll, I'll change how that is. But, most of the, most of the time, eight hours sleep, wake up just before five. I will do the usual. I suppose. <laughs> uh, have a shower, brush my you, teeth. You that you that routine that clockwork Ooh. up and at them. Yeah, yeah, straight oh. up. I'll Very head, jealous. head downstairs. I'll make a coffee. I'll either have a banana or a squares bar or both if I'm quite hungry. That riles people up, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's, that's again, one of the fucking main questions. Um, I'll have a cordyceps. I feel like it helps my endurance. Don't that bounces, it out, bounces out the squares bar. That, yes. That'll keep the people that are riled up happy, won't it? Yeah. Um, I'll, I was training at my own gym, but now we've got a HQ gym. So I'll get there for around 5.40. Girls classes start at 6. So I'll open up, get everything ready, get the music on. Um, I'll do a bit of cardio at the moment whilst them classes are on next class is the guys class which is at seven um, and i'll join in on that because i want to build this environment and i want to i want the people in my workforce to kind of go through what i've been through because i feel like that whole aspect of like building your physical also massively helps you mental and massively helps you in work it's all correlated all them three things business mindset physical like all them things together if they can arise together it's fucking fantastic you don't want to build one of them to such height and leave the other one in in the grave and then have to try and build it at a later stage so yeah so 7 a.m the guys classes start 8 a.m it finishes quick shower i'll usually order a starbucks for my breakfast what's your order uh four egg bites sometimes a porridge and Usually just like an iced Americano, a little bit of vanilla in it. No, you just lied to me. What is it specifically? Because I'm going to throw myself in with it. It's sugar-free vanilla, George. Which yeah, is, sugar-free vanilla. Which always, ma- always makes me Apo- cringe when apologies. I have to say it. So I'm dragging you down with me. Because <laughs> when I go, um, can I get a venti, skinny, sugar-free caramel latte, please? And there's always some <laughs> some man driving a transit van that tuts at me. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. He just walks in and just I'm goes, sorry. Uh, coffee. So I, uh, I just wanted to make clear that we have the same we yeah. have the same order and go through the same process there. But from there, what does a work day look like? Because so eight a.m. work usually starts. Most people get in between eight and nine that aren't in the classes. Um, 
I'll spend about an hour between before 9 a.m. where I can just get through all my emails, get through all my DMs, go on the represent accounts, make sure they're all okay, everything's going good. 9 a.m. till half 10 on a Monday is always with the board, with the team, just figuring out what we've got to do for that week. Then I'll go down to the like design area and we'll just discuss product. Products will be like my main focus until midday. I'll eat lunch at 12 every day, same thing, which is two packs of chicken barbecue from M&S, a pack of cabbage that goes in the microwave, a little bit of chili sauce on it. Sometimes I'll have a bit extra if I need some more carbs, I'd, I, but that's literally the usual thing. I'll either walk to M&S or I'll just drive there if it's inconvenient because I've got a lot to do. Just get that down me, 10 minute walk always after that lunch and sit back down and usually like afternoons are either fittings or design reviews. So I use myself as a fit model and we'll go through how necklines fit, how everything is on a garment. Usually that's like two, three times a week. Monday afternoons get quite hectic with that. Work usually finishes like 5.30, 6 p.m. Most people are out of the building by six. Um, either me, Steph or Mike will usually lock up, um, go home and I'm so hungry by then. All I can think about is food, nothing else but food. So it's like, I'll cook a steak, put some veg with that. Um, I'll, I'll either catch up on the guys that I watch on YouTube or I'll listen to a podcast. Again, I go for a little walk most nights, especially now because it's summer. Um, and because I'm doing like the classes in the morning, I'm not exerting myself as much as I should be. So I'll, sometimes I'll train later as well. Um, turn the sauna on, turn the ice bath on, watch a few podcasts, whatever I'm doing, check through my Instagram, reply to everyone who's commented through the day. Cause I usually do that morning then at that time, which is like 7 PM hit the sauna, hit the ice bath, hit the bed, nothing more. I see a twist of thread there and that's the standards, isn't it? I guess. Yeah. That's my standards. Does it change when you travel? It does slightly. It depends what the schedule is. Like if we're in LA and we've got to do training plans and I've got to train with two different influencers and we then got to go out at night because we're doing a meal with this guy or we're going to this club, I'll drink, I'll do whatever. Like I'm not complete, like regimented like that. Like, okay, I eat most of the same things every day and I, I do the same stuff most days, but I like to get out of it. Like I said earlier, every two weeks I'm away. And yeah, that is for business, but it's also for myself. Like I, I don't like getting stuck in the same routine over and over. It gets boring for one. And number two, I'm not learning. I'm not seeing things. I'm not in other places. I'm not experiencing things. And I need that to actually be creative. I think that's quite an unconventional approach to things because a lot of the morning routine discussions online are very dogmatic. Yeah. You should do this all the time. This is how you should exist. Whereas you can turn it on and off. The standards there, obviously, they don't deviate, but you can turn it on and off without any sense of feeling like you've let yourself down or like yeah. you've made a mistake. Has that always been the case? Um, no, for a very long time, I thought that you had to do everything the same. And I was stuck in that phase for like probably a year, maybe more, um, of just doing the exact same thing, not wanting to go out, not wanting to do other things. It was just bang, 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 get it done, get it done. But like if you want to be creative and you want to meet people and you want to expand like your own knowledge like you can't just do that sat in your house you can read as many books as you want they all tell you the same thing and you can listen to as many podcasts as you want and they'll all say the same thing but like as a person you need to you need to be out there in the world you need to be going doing different things you got to like you got to even like scare yourself right going on a podcast like scares me i get nervous doing things like that that's something that's completely out of my routine. Like today's out of my routine. We slept for what, four hours last night? Yeah, 3.48 according to my whoop. 3.48. so unconventional for me as well. I, I mean, it, what's, what's mental is that this has come at probably the busiest week of my year so yeah. far. On a, just, on just a week, random Tuesday as well. On a random Tuesday, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the Sunday to Sunday cycle I've got this week, I was intimidated by. Genuinely actually worried that I wouldn't be able to do it, that I wouldn't be able to sit here and switch my brain on. Right. But what's mad is it's been so chaotic but I feel more energized day to day because everything I'm doing this week is exciting and moving things forwards and it's and with cool people in different places. And there's a routine that underpins it. But over the years, I've got more and more comfortable with the fact that 
because I've said I'm going to do something, that can be the, the standard, the constant, but yeah. life, life isn't constant, is it? So yeah. you can't punish yourself when you can't replicate something that was set up for yeah. one set of circumstances right? in different circumstances. Yeah, and, and look, you can change and adapt. You can go back to that routine, and if, if it's going to change your body composition or your strength or whatever it is that you're focusing on, you can get back there in a couple of weeks anyway. Like when you mentioned about traveling, like I'll go to LA, I'll, I'll drink, I'll party, I'll do a lot of stuff that I wouldn't conventionally do at home, but I'll gain so much from it. I'll meet so many different people. Collaborations can happen. I can work on Machine Gun Kelly's next album merch. Like these things don't happen when you're sat in your fucking office, staring at a wall, doing the same thing day, day in, day out. Do you have total trust in the team behind you for you to go off and do those things i do now and that's why i do them that's why i'm sat here today because i know that the engine is oiled and that there's people in positions that will not let things happen that i wouldn't let happen but usually would so i've got like an amazing team i know you mentioned about the ceo and i forgot to answer earlier <laughs> but yeah i've got people in place that are doing the right things for the business which allows me this time where i can come and spend time with you i can learn from you we can get some hard workouts in we can do like what i actually love doing how difficult was it from an ego point of view to let go of that control because ceo if we're going back to twitter threads is a popular phrase <laughs> and it's something people attach a lot of ego to yeah and it's something that's done to death in so many different ways and different social media. I, I i've kind of the term the terms become a bit gray in terms of what actually means what are the criteria but you very much were the ceo of a business that was turning over enough to hit the criteria has enough people to hit the criteria so you could legitimately call yourself that which comes with some status in society people people want to be in that position and yeah but like you've had control for so long what is it it's a word yeah it's a, it's a bunch of letters i if you ever go on my social media you'll never see i've ever called myself a ceo like i don't care i don't care literally what anyone's titles is whether at the bottom of the business or the top of the business or they own the business, I don't care. Like, it doesn't matter. As long as you're doing what you should be doing and you're doing it at a high level, that's fantastic. I don't need to be the CEO of my brand. Like, it doesn't matter to me. I have no ego attached to it. Is there ego attached to the control that you let go with the responsibilities? Um, at first, it was hard. It was difficult. Um, not really ego, but just, like, control of, like, money and, like, what what actual decisions are getting made but like that person is in that place to drive the business his incentives are through driving the business and if he makes me happy I, like i'm gonna make him happy like we're, we're in this together we're in we're, we're all we're all in the same boat right whoever's fucking steering it it doesn't matter as long as we're steering in the right direction and we're all focused on what we want to gain out of it from a fitness point of view what does a typical week look like in terms of methodology and approach? Because I know you're all over the place in terms of classes and, and, and things here, but people, people are, I'm very structured and have a lot yeah, of intent are, behind every, yeah. every session. And that's for specific outcomes, whereas you're quite different, aren't you? So is, is there even such a thing as a typical week of training for you? Or is it more you want to move your body and reap the rewards of that to underpin the commercial side of what you're doing? I think for the first few years of like running and getting into CrossFit, there was no exact goals that I ever wanted to do. I didn't want to compete. Like I found that frightening. Um, then I found out about high rocks and I was like, okay, I'll try that. Then Jake, who is now a coach at represent, who's been a coach at hybrid. Like he put me together a six week high rocks plan, um, leading up to the London high rocks, which I stuck to. And that's the first plan I've ever stuck to. Like I've never believed in plans. I just make my own workouts up. I like looking at CrossFit workouts. I like looking at hybrid workouts. I like looking at running workouts. I like looking at track workouts and just make my week up. And that's what I put on the 247 app. It's just what I do um, with no specific end goals in mind. But he gave me this high rocks plan that I stuck to and it shaved like four minutes off my time. So that kind of like proved to me that, okay, things can work if you actually like do them. And I know you're fully invested in that, but I like... I've never needed to care that much. But the flip side is, for me, it can go the other way where I then go through periods of craving randomization. Right. Because yeah, you're so stuck on one thing. Yeah. And I feel that as well when I'm doing it. When I wake up and I've got a program from someone else that's telling me to do 500 wall balls with sprints in between. I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to do that. 
but I've got to do that. <laughs> so yeah, I know what you mean. And there's always that, like when you've done a hard challenge, the, the backlog from that of getting back to the point where you really want to do it or you want to do something as hard again. It's so strange that like mental feeling of coming out of something that you've done really well at or you've succeeded in. Like no one really talks about what comes after that. We spoke a bit on camera earlier in the hills about how the typical business owner collection of letters CEO traditionally has looked a certain way, has almost been a bit of a caricature of a, I think what we used was an overweight a, American a man smoking. smoking. Yeah. yeah, the boss, the boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing Kingpin from the Spider-Man. Right, right, right. <laughs> that's what, I'm, that's <laughs> yeah. what I'm seeing at the moment, him. That's changed. And it's it's athletes that are running big businesses, It's or, or vice versa, it's big business owners that are almost becoming athletes. They're doing yeah. big events. They're committing to things that seemingly shouldn't fit with their schedule. And that circles right back to what you think is the thread of DNA that runs through everything that everybody you've interacted with does, which is the core buzzword of discipline. The people you meet on a day-to-day basis that are in the, the business circles that you moved in, in the modern world, are they all following a similar structure to you in terms of the key components of a day? Are they all training? Are they all focusing on recovery protocols? Are they all having specific times of the day that they do specific tasks? Yeah. And following that same pattern. Yeah. More recently, the guys that um, I meet, yeah, they're all doing the same thing. Like I've become really good friends with a guy called Ross. You might actually know Ross McKay. Um, Scottish bloke. Lives oh. in LA. Normally, normally that, that actually goes a long way when you say, oh, he's from Scotland. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, it's a big, it's a big country. But then you say the name and it's like, oh, oh yeah, well, I, do, like, I do know him. <laughs> but we no, own completely sure. different businesses, but we're like identical in the way we are. And like, I meet him in LA, but he's from Scotland and I'm from the north of England and we're like best mates now. Um, and you can just merge and sync on a day yeah, basis. The exact same like lifestyle. And there's so many of people like him, especially in areas like LA and New York and that are doing the same thing. I feel like it is a big thing. Obviously the Twitter circles where everyone's posting what they're doing. And yeah, I think like the new modern CEO is they're, they're competitive in business. So they're going to be competitive in sports if they can get into it. And obviously if you're a competitive person in business, you're going to do that. Like the CEO of flannels comes and does the high rocks with me. He's like, oh, we're at the start line. He's like, I'm, I'm going to beat you. It's like, I fucking love that. That's class. Oh, you not? <laughs> Next time. <laughs> it's won. fucking it amazing. Did you, did you, did you, do you get him? Do you get him in the last yeah. high rocks? Yeah. Good. Oh, okay. Just, just checking, just checking. Cause uh, that would have been an unfortunate end to that story. <laughs> mm. Yeah. But like, like, I feel like that competitive nature that you have in business, you can transfer to your physical. And like I said before about my staff, why I've put that gym in that office, which I don't need to do. Like, I don't need to try and motivate everyone. 6,000 square feet, isn't it? Yeah. Which could be so much other stuff yeah. from a business critical point of view, couldn't it? It could even be a real gym where people can come and train, but it's not as for the people inside my business because I want them. I, there was this image that I had in my head and I can never find it online. And I've seen it years ago. And it was three people stood looking out of a window and they were stood on books. And one side, one ledge of the books was like one pile of the books was short. One was really long and one had like one book there, three different people. And the per- it ended up being the same person, but like the half stacked books was physical. The full stack books was mental and the one stack book was business. And it's like, what's wrong here? That guy can't see out the window in business. The guy can see out the window in physical, but he can't see out of it in mental. It's like if you can bring all of them up to the same thing at the same time and you can do, you, your life can be like aligned in them three different areas. Like that's, that, that's mental clarity. That's how you're going to get to places, right? Yeah. Look at yourself. Physical is up here. Now your business is up here as well. You're mentally doing things that are, Again, going to make it up here, the podcast, everything you're doing, you're learning from other people. Like if you can implement them three things into the structure of your life and bring them all up together, it's amazing. I call I call the main components of my life pillars for that exact same there reason. You go. Yeah. So, so in, Easier way of explaining it. <laughs> <laughs> because they prop things up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there we go. I, I, think, I think I've actually seen the photo that you're talking about. And it, like, it's like a drawing almost, yeah, isn't drawing. it? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I've seen it at some point. And... Yeah, I I did a talk on Sunday where I I use this example and I use pillars because if one of them's cracking, 
everything's at risk of falling down. Yeah. But you can sort of, I don't know the technical term, you can fill it in with cork, something, filler. We'll go with filler yeah. <laughs> and, and keep the pillar propping everything else up. And for me, that is, that's kind of my, I'd say my relationships, my business and my training. Those, those are the big three. And if one slips, the other slip. And I can quickly find myself in a pretty aggressive downward spiral where yeah. I suddenly lose control of everything. And I, what I really struggled with last year when training for the double brutal was I found myself in that spiral. And I wasn't, it, all three almost fell down at the same time. And I became so frustrated with the fact that the things that I normally enjoy, all of a sudden I wasn't enjoying or excited about anymore. Why do you think I, that was? It, it's just because I think I let, I let the things that were staring me in the face that were difficult to solve the problem and find solutions to in the short term, build and build and build and build to the point where what I feared would happen if I let them continue to almost collapse. So it's things like this is this training load is difficult unless you find an assistant who can manage your diary and right. bookings and all these things. And I kind of knew that'd be the case, but oh, I'm not, I don't have the time to sit and go through all of these applications and all this. So I'll put that to the side for the time being, but yeah. I'd isolated what the solution was and then hadn't fulfilled on the action in the middle that got me to the solution. And in the time that it took for that to happen, the training load became too much. And then I started to get a bit irritable with Erin. I started to not enjoy dog walks. I started, I caught myself at points. I was doing the Johnny Walker experience, which is like a world-class to be fair. It was amazing. A whiskey tour in the, in the corner of Edinburgh. Yeah. And I was with friends that had come up for London for the weekend. And I caught myself just doing sums on my phone because I knew how many tours were available to book during the day. I knew how many people were in the room. I knew how much the tour cost. So I was just doing maths on how, what's the turnover of the day. I wonder how much these people have been paid. Just because I, I was in, I was so locked in to the only time I had was in training or in the yeah. businesses that I had no way of separating myself out from that. I and mean, as soon as I found myself in that position, everything had fallen down. I sort of had to rebuild the pillars slowly. Right. And that only came after the double because I, I got to the start line. I was very proud that I did because the circumstances were tough. I made it worse for myself though. And the lessons I learned along the way from a business and a personal point of view that now make my life easier mean that I'm much more aware of what right. pillars could could crack and, and, and bring things down with them. Isn't that what's great about it though, that you can go through them things and then become aware and realize. And you'll go through them a million times in life, but you'll still, it'll still happen like all the time. There's always going to be cracks in the pillars. But as long as you're aware of it and as long as you're reacting to it and doing the right thing to it, then you know, all the pillars are going to rise. 100%. Have you had any moments in the past couple of years where you felt like the walls come lying down, the ceiling's coming down with you? Because I know you've I know you spoken about, I've seen a story a while ago, you had a question where somebody was asking about what you, what, you, what your take on modern uh, mental health in the modern world was or something like that. And you were saying, unfortunately, you've never really suffered with a downturn in it much because you're so passion-led, you've got a great yeah. team around, you've got all these people. But when the challenges come along, when your back's up against the wall, when you're faced with the passion-led decisions in the business where you're thinking, oh, what do I do here? Have you found yourself in situations where you, you felt in that tailspin that I described? Or um, do No, you, do you know what? No, not really. In the past few years, no, because I've got a good team that can reassure decisions that we make. Um especially in business, like it's a brand that's growing and like there is perennial product in there and there is ways we can do different things. And like I said earlier about the kids stuff, like I can chop and change and, and do different things all the time. There's like, there's so much opportunity in the business that I'm not really worried if something not like happens that's going to affect it because we can change. We can always like pivot. We can always optimize something else. I feel like we're only just at the surface in the business where like there's so much opportunity for us that even if something comes down, we can bring something else up. Do you think living with Mike has mimicked some of the things that I get from my partner and Aaron from a household point of view? Do you think if you were living on your own, you'd feel as comfortable in your own presence to have the routines that you do to feel as comfortable in your own head? Because obviously you've read a lot of Brian Holiday, you've got all these things, you've got all this information. But when push comes to shove and you, you've had a long day, your head's been in certain things and you sat there on your own, you haven't really been in that situation because you live with your brother. He's, 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 moving, on, he's moving on with his, with his missus, isn't he? Yeah, he soon, will be. Which, yeah. Will, which will be maybe, maybe, maybe 
there's two questions here, which is, do you think he's propped you up along the way by sort of fulfilling that real supportive, we've got each other's backs role in a household, personal life point of view? And how do you think you'll defend when he's gone? Um, that's a weird question. I, like, I will never unleash all my feelings and stuff like that on Mike, whether it's business or whatever it is personal. Like, I'll talk to him over things and like, it, <sighs> It's hard to say because we, we live comp- like different lives. Like I'm an early guy. I wake up, I'm, I'm out of the house before he's awake and he only gets in from work by the time I've gone to bed. So we, we don't actually communicate that much in, in the home environment. Whereas in work, we do communicate a lot because we're both in the design team. But like when I've got, I, I know that putting pressure on Mike isn't the right thing to do. And if, if I can lead by example with training and lifestyle and the way to run a business that's great and mike can lead by example in different areas where he is because we're so different people um then i'm happy with that i'll never like i respect him so much that i would never like put a lot of pressure on him with how i'm feeling about anything and i'm, I'm it's probably a bad thing but i'm a very closed person um if i'm feeling a lot of stress or i'm not gonna say anxiety because i don't get anxiety but if i'm feeling stress or i'm not liking the way something is it's not usually Mike that I'll go to about that. It'll be my CEO or it'll be James or it'll be Steph. Um, but you know what I actually prefer to do rather than like let things out on people and, and affect how they feel. I prefer to just use my notes and write everything down. And I'll write, I like every weekend I'll write down how I felt like the week went. And like, then I'll analyze it and then maybe I'll send it to James and see what he feels about it. And then I'll get a bit of like clarity from, okay, now this, that wasn't actually the case and this would this happened and there's like the dynamic with me and mike isn't like that balance though isn't it you bring it out the best balance. in each other yeah 100 percent. like i couldn't live with anyone else um and like the the way i am and the way him he is it's just like perfect together because we, we have no egos against each other like there is absolutely no fighting no squabbling there's no decision making that i don't believe is right or he doesn't believe is right like we have the same vision we have the same outlook we have the same goals like we love the same things we do the same stuff like we we when i make a decision he knows it's right when he makes a decision i know it's right he's he's moving out soon which means the future is coming and the future is is coming for for rep as well because there's a lot on there's a lot on isn't there there's, there's a lot on always. <laughs> there's, there's a drop every week, yeah. it seems. But there is. <laughs> is. Is it every week or is nearly it? every week? Nearly every week. Um, yeah. I'm trying to make it every week, but there's there's a few weeks where we don't need to. When there's a huge collection, we let it have a yeah. taper off and stuff. Yeah. But future, you've had to recently reveal finances to the world for the first time, which yeah. I know is something you've been very, yeah, you've kept very close for a long time. Is, is it something you're lean into more from a business personality point of view or do you just want to let the business speak for itself when it comes to the numbers because they're obviously detached from you as an individual but with releasing the numbers people will now be able to attach predictions speculation net worth if you search george heaton all of these things that i assume you've done a good job of avoiding over the years so with the finances revealed with the growth of the company as it is what what does a long term look like what what is what is you sitting down with your notepad, looking at five years, you in the future, as you did when you were in 2019, who's the guy in the future? That same guy that I drew then. But like, there is so much more to go at. And every time we get to these pillars or these points where we, we always wanted to get to, then there's big, there's obviously more. Like the horizon's ever changing, isn't it? Same with everyone. Like you get to places that you thought you could never get to and then you expand on them. I think like, I'll always rather the product speak for itself and I don't care about numbers or titles and then I don't ever want to see, well, I'm not going to say I don't ever want to see, but I don't need to see my name on like rich lists and stuff like that. Like I don't care. I, I care that my business is great. Everyone inside the business is great. My family is great and I'm living the exact way I want to live. They're, they're what I define as success, not a release of numbers or who's chief of this or that or what this guy's worth doesn't matter to me a success and happiness one and the same to you yeah i think so yeah i think they're married is that the same for the team around you do you think everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet um 
I hope so. I think it's like a, a maturity and a development thing when you realize that like what what success and happiness is and if they can if there are something that is together in life, which I do think they are. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And what's made me most unhappy in the past is a definition of success that was being externally determined or, or in, at the in very least way? influenced. So the example, when I was at my worst, 2014 to 2016, mental health, depression that was getting progressively worse ultimately led to a suicide attempt. I this in university university yeah yeah, yeah. so so joined in 2014 October 2014 about two weeks later I didn't feel I didn't feel like I belonged and I felt like uni was too slow and we we've already laughed about this a bit earlier that at school teachers told my parents yeah. the world the real world does not match the intensity with which Fergus is existing and they thought oh, okay yeah he's, he's working hard he'll he'll enjoy uni and all this stuff but not saying they should have taken that seriously but looking back it's obvious how it could happen because I, I kind of determined, I, I discovered self-driven health and fitness, which made me see this really black and white way of improving myself on a day-to-day basis. And I thought, oh, wow, hard work put in equals outputs. If I apply myself in the same way with my exams, I might be able to actually go to the universities that I've heard of people talking about that could be amazing. So all of my existence became focused on trying to get into Oxford. Right. Didn't get past the interview stage, didn't get a place. That hurt. Ended up going to Durham, the graveyard also hurt and went full of ambition full of hope wanted to make the most of it going to a great university let's go and i just arrived and it was just slow yeah. slow paced a lot of pissing around a lot of stuff that wasn't moving me forwards and i'd set a plan before i got to uni on what the future looked like that was based on these external factors of best grades possible best job possible best promotion possible best car possible best house possible best holidays possible best retirement holidays and then you're dead and i'd map the whole thing out and then you're dead and it and it balances out as foolish because i was just basing my future plan on what i thought the right thing to do within the circumstances that i had available to me i didn't think about what i was actually driven by or passionate about and the answer at the time was fucking obvious i'd gone from 102 kilos a good rugby player due to physics not necessarily rugby skill to sub 80 kilos because I just became absolutely obsessed with health and fitness. I sort of went, went into the personal training qualification when I was 17, 18, sort of did it throughout that period just so I could get keys to the school gym so I could train at five in the morning. Yeah, I was reading every morning. I was doing all the things that I now talk about on podcasts with people before I'd had any external influence. Discovered that and then tried to place myself into like this, this mold that society and the people around me sort of had presented to me. And Edinburgh is very white collar, generally speaking. It, it's very corporate, and that's great, I think, in many ways because there's loads of stability. Yeah. But I didn't really ever conceive of going a different path because I had good grades, and I could see I could see a roadmap forward. But that's because it was the easy roadmap. Yeah. And then when I got to uni, that plan went out the window. But because it's the plan I said I was going to do, I was going to fucking stick to it. And then every day I felt like a failure more and more and more and more and more because I wasn't operating in the way I thought I should be to move myself towards the plan that actually no longer made sense. So I was just punishing myself for no reason when the simple thing to do would have been, right, what are the current circumstances? Things have changed. How do we move forwards from here? But I never had that conversation. I I didn't have that conversation with myself until 2018 when I'd actually come out of the back end of recovering from depression or a suicide attempt and found myself slipping back into it when I was discontented with the work I was doing in London. But the work I was doing in London... I took the first job that came up as, an, as a grad scheme because everybody was doing grad schemes in London. Yeah. Not because I wanted to go and work for Heineken in London and get steaming three, four times a week. It was because it was a grad scheme. You, here's a grad scheme, Fergus. Yeah. Take it. Go and do it. It yeah. wasn't, what would I like to do? How can I make the most of it? What is going to make me intrinsically happy? It was, what does success look like? And then in your own time, you can focus on happiness. Whereas now, they're one and the same. Like, just completely one and the same to me. And like, do you think that's the way you should look at life from a younger age? Like, what was the catalyst that made you then change that? Was it the amount of depression you got? Or was it you realized, oh, I like changing my body. I like looking at nutrition. I like looking at all this stuff, different stuff. Like, what was the actual like catalyst for that change? 
it was finding something that I enjoyed that I could see results in. So then going back to the question you asked me about the younger guy, yeah. what do you tell him? Is that what we tell him? So me specifically, I can be more specific here because it, it's me. So I, I know this person, I've yeah. got the context. I'd essentially say to, to look a little bit deeper on what things you wake up in the morning excited about yeah. and to lean more into them because I could translate that excitement into the future. So I, 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 enjoyed, I enjoyed elements of school, but I enjoyed the process of seeing the metrics tick up towards the hypothetical result I was going to get that was going to get me the thing that I thought I should be getting. Right. Not because I was enjoying the actual thing itself. Yeah. What I was enjoying was training at five in the morning, was bringing my mates along with me, was watching Max Tuning and Rob Lipset in my room yeah, late at night, all that stuff. But you can apply that to any any industry and anything that anyone is interested in who's listening to this. Like, it doesn't have to be training specific, does it? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, people might wake up excited about arts and crafts. They might wake up excited about gardening. It doesn't yeah. matter what it is. But if you feel that excitement, lean the fuck into it. That's what I would have told myself. I would have shaken myself and said, don't follow this path that's laid out for you. Yeah. Follow the path that... You can, you can still follow the path, but you can... You can look at things as well. Yeah. yeah. Find, yeah. find out something else. Yeah. It doesn't need to be as binary as, but maybe going down that wrong path is what leads you to the right path. Well, because I wouldn't change anything. Down, yeah. Exactly. Cause you go down it so far that you realize, no, I'm not fucking doing that. And it's just having that ability to then change after you realize that you don't want to do it. It's exactly that. And it sounds strange to say, I feel fortunate to have survived a suicide attempt, but that's who I am. That's something I, will happily discuss with anyone I meet anywhere and everywhere because it's just a part of who I am and it's something I'm I'm open to discussing and comfortable with. But the bottom line is it's made me who I am right now. And who I am right now is happy, content, and moving in a direction that I'm very pleased with. And I'm only moving in a direction that I'm very pleased with because of everything that's come before me. So I think that that's the thing. But what what I really struggle with, and I can imagine you do the same, is the fast pacedness of everything means that it's difficult to look back at the person you were three yeah. years ago or the teenager right. that would be jaw hitting the floor wondering what 12 years from now would look like. And that's what I want to get better at from a personal point of view. So from a day-to-day -day side of things, do you make time to actually be present and proud of what you've created? Because you, you, you've created a community, you used the word community earlier, which yeah. again, it has connotations on Twitter, on Reddit, et cetera, et cetera. It's a marketing term in many ways now. But you've created a community globally. You've done some of the coolest shit with some of the coolest people in the world. Yeah. There's now a fitness derivative of it. So you've got high fashion, you've got runway stuff historically, and now you've got a completely different market. I mean, you've, you've got a range that covers pretty yeah. much everyone. And a there's whole more development job. to come. Do you wake up every morning excited and proud, most importantly? Because yeah. it's, it's crazy. I do. I wake up every morning. I'm grateful for the position I'm in. I'm extremely happy. I'm so excited. Like the reason I can wake up and train so hard and work all day and not not flag and not fall asleep is because I'm so excited. Like I'm building this brand, which is changing people's lives inside the business and the customers that are coming to us or watching our YouTube or whatever it is that are getting inspired by it or they're changing their lives with the way the body is or just through fashion and through what I've done telling my story that they can then go and do it themselves. Going back to that like younger version like the only reason I put this YouTube out is for a documentation of what we've done. Because I it, like when I was that 18 year old kid, I didn't have a blueprint. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have anything. If you go on, if you look at my Instagram now as an 18 year old kid, you don't see flash cars and all this stuff that could be flaunting and private jets. You see a link to a YouTube channel that shows exactly what we do, exactly how we do it, how hard we work, what we actually talk about, what we what we go and do. And like for me to put that out there to the younger George, like that kid that was starting, would mean a fucking million. What would you say to him? What would I say to the the 19 year old kid that's just starting yeah. to present? Then man, it's gonna be a journey. But it's gonna be a good one. That's it. That's it. And everybody has access to that because it all comes down to you just taking one decision. To tell your dad, I'm not going to work for you. <laughs> yeah, and, literally. And here we are. <laughs> here we are. 80 million turnover incoming. People all around the world. A big attack on America. 
metaphorically speaking. Yeah. <laughs> Biden. Yeah. Just, just to confirm. <laughs> Don't flag this. Thank you. In terms of that market and then the rest of the world to come, what, what are you most excited about about the next couple of years? Um, I wake up every morning and I'm excited because I will check my DMs and I'll be like, this is fucking incredible. Everyone loves the product. Everyone loves the customer service. Everyone loves what's going on with the business. Like, I'm excited for every single day. I'm not necessarily excited for three years time we'll be doing this or we're going to hit this target in 2026. That doesn't matter to me. As long as I wake up, I'm happy. I love my day. Like I get home, I, I spend five, 10 minutes just thinking how good was today? Were we happy? Did we win the day? Did we have a successful day? Like, is everyone happy in the business? Did like, did we succeed with everything we did? Did I, and, and not all, it's not always great. Like it's not always going to be a phenomenal launch night. It's not always going to be everyone's happy about everything. There's always going to be little things, but as long as you can keep optimistic and be grateful for it and just be happy, like there's, there's no reason not to be. One step forwards, one risk at a time. That's all the brand's been built on and it's gone from strength to strength. And I think that's a message that's translatable to everybody listening. Yeah. One, one step forwards is the key. It's whenever, whenever I am in the position you're in, whenever I'm speaking to anyone, it all comes down to, one moment I remember when I just thought, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to figure this out and take. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do the thing tomorrow. But I'm going to start the process of the thing. Yeah, just put it into your mental space. Like think about it. Yeah. If it's in your mind, you're going to eventually come to it, aren't you? Yeah. And it's mad how much can happen just by making it up as you go along. Because I'm firmly of the opinion that absolutely everybody is making it up as they go along. I'm making it up as I go along, and I know billionaires that are making it up as they go along. So you can also make it up as you go along. Yeah. There Everybody is making it up as they go along. <laughs> Build the wings as you fly. Well, mate, I've really enjoyed that. I've really enjoyed today. It's been fantastic to get yeah, you up no. finally, and we've we've got the day. Maybe you are putting a good word with those billionaires. They've spoken to the the guy upstairs. The give, give us the best weather I've ever had in Edinburgh. Yeah, Johnny no. Johnny will be absolutely furious <laughs> that he was not in the pants this morning. But no, I've had a beautiful day. It's been fantastic. Like I love being able to do these things with no. like like minded people, have great conversations, and just enjoy it. I really appreciate it, and I'm excited to see what's to come. But every day's excitement is is the focus, isn't it? That should be the goal, and, uh, and I've learned a lot today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, cheers.